Thank you guys, and thank you for sharing. Like, this has been uh, tremendous. I've been uh, at my current company for eight years, so I've been, you know, once you've been there for a while, you uh, start speaking the same, start thinking the same. And so to get these other perspectives, one is refreshing and something I plan to take back to my team, but also connected a ton of dots for me, um, specifically in this franchise concept, which was something I brought up uh, in the podcast with Scott. He said, could you expand upon that a little bit more? Sure, Scott. Uh, for the leaders in the room, I also did uh, in parallel, uh, this is very much a framework for AEs. I presented a couple months ago at another conference for leadership um, really focused in on how do you create an environment of a, sales, a winning sales culture, which is really like how do you create a franchise and collaborate with franchise owners. So I'm happy to share that with folks um, afterwards. So as I mentioned, this is a framework. Um, it, it's something that I created uh, on the opposite end with what Kyle shared yesterday as he was going to President's Club and kind of reflecting upon it. I was on the other side of things at a previous job where um, things weren't going as well, and I needed to do some reflection uh, to improve. Um, I had had some early success. I hit that two to three year kind of dip, and I, was, uh, I had a lot of tailwind that faced uh, a lot of headwind, and I had to change, and I had to change quick. And so this was some reflection I did. Uh, I wouldn't say it was for survival, but the things that I wanted, like the career longevity that Deb has, the opportunities that Trong mentioned yesterday, um, the opportunities to do even more. I wanted those, and I had to change and adapt to do so. And so I um, developed uh, some inspiration, uh, which when you're trying to turn things around, of course you think of McDonald's, uh, like most normal people. It's typically where I do some of my best thinking. Um, but I had two experiences uh, in franchises. Uh, both with QSRs, quick service restaurants. The first was, as a 16-year-old, I rebelled against my parents. I was raised on a farm. Um, I said I can go earn my own living, so I went during a summer and worked at KFC. Why? Because I love chicken and I love the mashed potatoes. Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> I, it's going to come back and haunt me at some point. But um, so that lasted two weeks. One is, uh, again, I love the chicken. I took a lot of creativity, uh, liberty, with the mixes, they have a uh, crunchy and they have an original. I combine both. <laughs> I'd get a lot of people coming back and saying, who's making the chicken? This is delicious. The manager inquired how I went about making it differently. I said, the ratios I've changed. This is a much better <laughs> recipe. <laughs> I did that multiple times and uh, was asked not to come back. Anyway, that's about <laughs> as rebellious as a childhood I ever had. But, um, the second experience I had was, uh, this was, you know, life uh, gives you so many fortunate opportunities and sometimes you, you take advantage, sometimes you don't. This one I took advantage of. I started my career at D2B out of Chicago, which is a large advertising agency, which still oversees global advertising for McDonald's. I started as an associate, uh, which an associate really means that you are a really great scribe and somewhat of a pledge to leadership. So uh, I was fortunate enough that they, uh, it was out of Chicago, McDonald's was headquartered out of Oak Brook at the time, now they're headquartered in Chicago, but they would take me out for these owner and operator meetings, which were these big global meetings where the franchise owners would come in and meet with the corporate leadership. And really what was discussed was ideas and how to improve the business. And I was fortunate because I didn't really have to prepare, my whole thing was I was the ears to take in the information, to bring insights back to the company. But really what I was observing was the relationship between these uh, uh, franchise owners and the corporation and that there was this co-leadership about them. There wasn't a hierarchy, there wasn't, I have this role, you don't. It was, we're in this together to drive this business forward. That was the first thing, the co-leadership. The second one was, was transformation. As I looked at all these people within the business, they all had transformative lives. Um, much like myself, I grew up on the farm. You know, I wanted to go and do other things, even though my dad wants me to come back. Many of these people had come from different places as well and had improved their lives, but also were doing things beyond just running a franchise or running a corporation. Um, much like Jackie had mentioned, these were big community leaders, and I just saw something in them that I wanted. The third one is, is ROI, 
They put an investment of capital in the business and they wanted something back. So this experience kind of sunk in the back of my mind. I went forth and did some strategy work at the agency, was working till 2 a.m. quite a bit and thought, huh, there must be a better way. I want to get into sales. They seem to do a lot of great experiences. They seem to make a lot of, a lot of great money. I think I can do this. So I ventured into sales. And, um, and so this didn't really venture up until my second job in the sales. It was, again, my second or third year where I said I needed to, to improve uh, my process, my framework for doing this. And so one of the big things that Jeff Weiner, who's our CEO, talks about, and this, this message is more for leadership, so I'm gonna go back to the franchise. This is a, a little bit of my advertisement for the other PowerPoint, is ultimately when employees come to work for you, your, your biggest objective is to have transformational experiences. And I think, I believe this is what has helped LinkedIn have success over the last 15 years, is as we bring people in, we make an agreement to them that we're going to give them this transformational experience. Much like Jackie meant, uh, talked about was, there's things that are beyond just monetary things that drive us. There's a great book by Paul Lawrence where he talks about the five biological drivers. The book is called Driven, highly recommend it. Or go check out Josh, uh, Josh Kaufman's personal MBA, which gives more of the cliff notes on it. But number one is this driver for acquisition, which is most of what we want in terms of monetary acquisition. Two is protection. All these biological drivers make us tick, but the more you have, the more, so if you're creating a product, you wanna have these five drivers because it makes your product much stickier. Number two is to protect. So remember when I was talking about, I gotta figure this out. I was in protection mode to protect what I have. The third is bonding. We all love to bond, much like we were talking about today in terms of us coming together and sharing ideas, but also the relationships. Those all happen at the workplace as well. The fourth one is education. All professionals are driven to educate because it, it funds the bonding, funds the protection, and also funds the acquisition. The fifth one is experiences. People love to have experiences. And so the story goes, as you have more of these, it makes things stickier. And so one of the things we think about in terms of transforming people's lives is how do we hit on all five of those? I think that makes us a complete professional, not only in the workplace, but also as we take this home as well. So that's just my quick advertising. The other one, it is our responsibility. The second one is, I believe when we think about ownership, co-ownership and franchise owning, I think as sellers, we're going through a major transformation today. Uh, this is a quote from Amy Hood, two earnings reports ago, where she was talking to Wall Street about the success that Microsoft has had with Azure in the cloud. She paid major kudos to the sales team, which doesn't happen a lot on Wall Street. Um, but what she talked about was you couldn't tell the difference between a seller in the field, which I think we saw from Trong yesterday, very impressive, versus someone who's creating code back in Redmond. And so when you look at the five uh, pillars of any business, you see your problem, you create value, you market it, you sell it, you deliver the value, and the fifth one is accounting. When you see the Microsoft sellers in the field, they're doing all five of those. Those are what executives do that's driving value back into the Microsoft business, but also driving value back to the clients as well. But I also think that we want it. Uh, this, is, uh, this happened this year, um, where Steve Kerr, who was against the Phoenix Suns, took a moment to turn all the coaching over to the players. And essentially said, you know, I love this quote, it's the player's team and they have to take ownership of it. And as coaches, our job is to nudge them in the right direction, guide them, but we don't want to control them. They determine their own fate. So when we go back to when I was going through my little slog, I was blaming things that I could control, and I didn't own my fate. When you co-own a business and you put capital in, you want to make sure you get an ROI on that. So you need to take ownership as an account executive because I think you want it, but I also think the market's going to demand it from you. All right, so, so when looking at a franchise, and this is where have an open mind <laughs> and questions, i um, happy to answer right now too. But the way I looked at this was, when I was looking at the relationship of franchises and thinking about this co-ownership, 
there's a, three relationships that take place. There is the corporation. In most traditional aspects, they see the problem. They create a product. They market it. They sell it. You kind of sell it too. You deliver the value. And there's the accounting of it. The owner really there is there for execution. But they have capital, so they have some leverage. What I've observed in other kind of franchise systems is that most of the owners only give the capital and execute. What they need to do is much like the McDonald's model, which is they're ingesting and they're pushing more, they're overseeing the entire business, they're sitting on committees, they're giving feedback from the field to impact product, to impact marketing, to impact sales, to impact the value delivery, and sometimes also the counting as well. And so when I think about it from an AE perspective, because I tried this this weekend on a bunch of my sales friends in New Orleans in the morning when they're hungover and they're like, Mike, quit pitching us on your ideas. We're kind of sick of this. Is, is I think we put capital too. And I don't think that we, we give ourselves enough credit in what we bring to the table. We bring a ton of capital to it. Where the corporation stays the same, they see the problem, they, they fix it. They have the, the marketing, they have the sales, they have the, the value of delivery, and we're just selling there. Most of us put us in the bucket of just, we're the sellers in this. But what we do bring, and this is where I think we need to acknowledge it, we bring capital. When you have capital, you have leverage, and our capital is significant, specifically when HR talks about the people are our product. This is true. This is what they believe. You bring time, you bring, you bring energy, and you bring skill. All this is precious and you should see it as laying down capital that you need to get a return on. And so step one is, you know, I, I ask people when I'm recruiting and when I'm interviewing is, is like, what do you ultimately want to do? But I'm also qualifying them, letting them know is when you join LinkedIn, and this is the same process I went through, is you're gonna go through a transformational experience. We wanna help you be more productive and successful, and specifically, on my team, I'm gonna push you to do this. But I need you to put your capital in. This isn't gonna be a short term, you're not a rental to me, this is an experience where you're just gonna stay for two years. I need you to admit that you're bringing your time, energy, and skill, and I think that's greater sometimes than the, than the cash that you're bringing in. Now keep in mind, I'm saying this, but obviously we always, we always have to hit our numbers, but I want them to know that they are important and they are a co-leader in this business and I need their input to move things forward. Number two is you gotta sign a paper. Like you gotta make this a serious commitment. Franchise owners probably pay a couple of nice million dollars, they sign a piece of paper, they go and get the keys, they open the McDonald's, the KFC or whatever, whatever it is. You gotta have a proof of ownership. And what I ask, and this is what I did for myself and Dewan, I, I liked this yesterday when you were talking about starting with the why. I ask all my sellers within the first 90 days they start, I need an individual development plan from you. I need you to start your why. I need you to list all the skills that's gonna to take to get there and what is your timeline to develop those skills. That's their business plan. That's their kind of title of ownership. Now, what I, what I saw at McDonald's was these owners and operators, again, you wanna oversee your investment and again, your time, your energy, and your skills. Horrible coloring of the slide anyways. I don't, it's a little, a little dizzying, but anyway. Uh, so, so again, the five, the five pillars of any business, value creation, marketing, sales, value delivery, and finance. As a seller, I had deep relationships with all five. I wanted to be on every single one of those committee, not like over the top over on these committees, but I wanted to be top of mind as big things were happening so I could influence. Much like the McDonald's franchise owners do, I wanted to be invited to all of those meetings because again, I invested capital, I want to see a return, and I want to be able to influence this. Two is I am one of the, I don't want to say the best, but in terms of collaboration, I'm trying to help them get to their next spot. So when we talk about clients, OKRs, or KPIs, I'm looking also at my internal folks as well because I want to ha help them have su success. But I also want to lead because again, we hold on to some of the best information. The McDonald's franchisees brought so much information from the field that essentially directs 90% of corporations' reaction to it. I want to be the leader in that as well. But for me to be effective, I have to be knowledgeable and develop skills in each of those buckets. And so when I look at my why, 
my why is I want to make people competitive. I want to make them more productive and successful. My long-term aspirations is I want to be able to pop into a community and help create economic opportunities for people in this community. Before I do that, I'd love to have a stop as a chief revenue officer. But it starts with me starting to develop these skills now with these folks because collaboration, content, skill development, all will apply and ladder up to those eventually. I have to do these things now, do the hard work, make myself uncomfortable, so that when I get to hopefully an opportunity to go for one of my higher goals, I'm able to do that. So trust the process and enhance it. So there's, uh, for those who aren't familiar, Philadelphia 76ers, uh, <laughs> Joel uh, Embiid, um, is the Sixers have been, had some tough years. They made the playoffs this year, and they're struggling against the Celtics right now. Um, but it's, it's kind of comical in that the 76ers went through some years where they just weren't winning a lot of games. And so they kept getting these top draft picks over and over again. And there was this joke of essentially, trust the process. <laughs> we're going to keep tanking a few years when we get some top lottery draft picks. Sometimes it feels like when you're riding within a company and even a corporation, it gets a little comical because you're kind of like, where is this thing going? Things are not going well. <laughs> McDonald's has gone through quite a few of these. They're back again when everyone thought that they were out. They trust the process. All the owners and operators also trust the process, but they also know that they have to enhance that process. Again, you got to protect your investment. And so when I look at this is I don't want to get too far out of the lanes of what leadership is giving me. On the left-hand side, this is what the LinkedIn process is. Um, this is how they ask us to operate. You can see there's not um, really crisp definitions of everything. But for the most part, I operate in that manner. The director also gives me some processes I need to work within. But I also develop my own. I call it the high process. I have this whole honeycomb design process. But anyway, I, when I'm working with my cross-functional folks, when I'm in those committees, I'm also sharing this is my process. My process ladders up to my director's process. That process ladders up to the LinkedIn process. So I'm fitting within the process. But I'm also taking mine, and I'm enhancing and giving feedback all the time in terms of how we can improve. Five is, so play nice with others. I, I see this a lot you know, as I've managed a sales team. Um, man, we can be tough on people. Like, uh, you know, I'll have AEs who will CC me on with someone with accounting or legal, and I essentially email them back, and they said, hey, we don't blow people up on email. We pick up the phone. We give them a call. There's something going on in their life that's impeding them from helping you at this time. Figure out what it is and remove it. But also, there's so much more value when we, when we play nice with each other because what we get back is significantly higher. And so when I was um, on McDonald's, I would see, again, these owners and operators and then these executives. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of pride in that room, right? They would go at it. But at the end, they would hug, literally hug. Like there was a deep, deep relationship there. And it was just this sense, I was just like, again, first professional experience, I was like, there is, they've got each other's backs. And it's not just your needs, it's there. Because sometimes as sellers, we do get, we are somewhat the gods of the, the organization. The revenue makes it all go, and we get a lot. But we also need to give a lot back to folks. And so uh, this may seem a lot of crazy, but this is, um, I, keep, I try to plan out my internal relationships just as significant as my external relationships. These are the folks, and the list kind of goes down. I, I map out. I have one-on-ones. I have scheduled meetings where I bring teams together in advance to have conversations about ideas in terms of how we can improve or where we should be taking things because I want to keep a very active pool of ideas going into them again for influence so I can oversee my investment again. And a lot of this now is from my team, but in the past I did this as a seller as well. And all of that, when I go to my client, Microsoft used to be my largest client before I moved into the management role, I brought all that value back to them, but it was created because of my relationships and collaborations with my internal folks. Next is make heroes out of customers and partners. Uh, so. I have two young kids, third on the way. Uh, the four and two year old, Isla and Oliver, love McDonald's. I take them to Shake Shack. I take them to In and Out. I'm like, this is, this is so much better food. Like, why do you not love this? But when they go to McDonald's, it's an experience. 
Like, sure, it tastes good. They love the Happy Meal. They just love the yellow of it. They create an amazing experience on that. So we want to do the same for our customers, but also our internal partners. Um, I forget who mentioned this yesterday, but we, so this is our pursuit plan. It's, it's a workbook, but this is focused in on most pursuit plans in the past was like, how are you going to get to your goal? How are you going to get to your goal? We take the approach of, I want to help, I want the CMO, when I was calling on Microsoft, to remember three things about LinkedIn and Mike Dudgeon. Three things, three things only. And these are all laddered up to the three things. So this example here is brand, legion, and thought leadership, and everything else all the way down, all the tactics all ladder up to those three strategies of making people look like heroes. We try to focus in on promotions. We also try to get them accolades, things like that. End of the day, people love refrigerator material, but they have to give something quarterly. And so we hone in specifically what those are, and we focus in on it. So one of the big things um, I see within the sales team and what um, I try to do a lot of as a seller, again, this is your investment. You want to see it go in a good way. Is as sellers, we tend to, to take a lot and not give back a lot. Um, somebody made a good example the other day where um, he just joined us from the management team, but his, his wife essentially called him out where um, she says, would you talk to your client the same way you're talking to me right now? And what that means is, is like you give all your good to all your clients, but when you come home, you give me the bad. And so we see that a lot with our AEs where we give and we give and we give to our clients because that's what drives the short-term revenue. But keep in mind there's people on the other side of the equation when you come back into the office. But also as you take more resources out, you got to bring some more stuff in because that's what keeps us sustainable. If we don't, it's going to start to taper off. And again, going back to transformation is, is where, where Jeff talked about, it's, it's paramount. We create this whole experience for people where we're transforming them that they want to give back into the organization. And I've had the experience where people don't give back in the organization. I've seen where they do. It creates the business because everyone's providing more value back into the business. And so over time as an AE, I've um, created products, I've created processes, I've created training, I've created events, in all hopes of making it scalable to help someone else. More people are now doing that in return for me and the people on my team. This is something I created with uh, another, team member, another team member, which out of everything I've created is something I'm a bit more proud of is, is this was uh, something we were doing for Relationships Matter, which is one of our key values. And we created a board of directors, which essentially is like, who's on your board of directors that's going to help you get to your goals? And how are you going to help them in return? And so it was an educational sheet but also a worksheet for people to use. And we had everyone from individual contributors all the way up to executive ranks rethinking about who's on my board of directors. And so the ask is, is to make sure you're contributing back into the business. So protect your brand. Um, this is a lesson that I learned, uh, again, was raised in Indiana on a farm. And it was always talk of your actions should speak of you. You shouldn't speak of yourself. Well, the world will change a little bit. <laughs> um, what I've learned is you have to do it in your most authentic self um, and not be someone who's just jumping around saying, like, look what I did. But you do need to make people aware of the value you're bringing into the organization and also to your clients because no one will recognize it. Seeing, being in the leadership position now, I talk about this a lot because you're taking a lot of information from a lot of different places. Unless you're sharing, people aren't going to know. And so. This is what was, uh, again, my, I'm not like, I'm a planner, but I use the planning so I have a ton of freedom. My wife will tell you, like, <laughs> on the weekends, I'm like a total just like, all right, let's just go to the beach. But like Monday through Friday, I want to crank. And so I have these things, a process, and, and I just knock it out. I knock it out early in my process. And so um, this is what I call the protect the brand, where I have leadership, cross-functional, and peers. And when I plan to spend time with them, not only hearing about them, but also sharing some of the things I'm going to, because I'm looking for people to jump on board on some of the ideas and the things I'm working on. But they'll, the, I'm also looking to kind of not self-promote, but make them aware that I can provide value to them when needed. So 
the last part is, is, is as I've struggled, it's supposed to be number 10, number 10 went away, but um, you know, we put all, these t all this time into being at an organization where I talked about with the franchise of, you put capital in, you should get some sort of equity in return. And my previous role, you know, I left and then I had to go start a new job. It took me like a year to really get up and going. I pretty much left with, with no equity in the sense of transformational experience. And so what we try to work, and I did this for myself, is this mindset of at the end of my period, again, I ask people to say, what is your next play when they join? And so I either want them to buy or I want them to sell. Buy in the sense of you may take on more responsibility. You may want to go into leadership. You may want to go into product. You may want to go into marketing. Or you may want to be the, def, the best damn AE ever. I want you either to buy into more, or if, you're, or if it comes on your next play where you want to depart and go somewhere else, which I call sell, that's OK too. But if you decide to do that, we have uh, what we call uh, active and passive candidates, which is a LinkedIn term. What you want to go after is a passive candidate, someone who's happy and role. And if you can attract them, that person is typically much more valuable than someone who's actively looking. It's, it's proven. Um, I can show you some of the numbers behind it. But the hope is, is that someone comes after you with an opportunity of the lifetime so that when you leave LinkedIn, you have gone to another much better place. And so that's where I call sell, is where you decide to cash in your chips and leave LinkedIn. But hopefully, it's someone who's approached you with so many different opportunities, you can go into a much bigger experience. But I listed Greg Flynn. He was someone who was talked about uh, when I was on McDonald's. Uh, he now drives $1.9 billion in revenue. And he's someone who I have kind of followed who, who is more of the buy aspect. He lives in San Francisco. He started off with two Burger Kings. Uh, that was his father's. His father's uh, decided to go to buy a, a $2 million like, palace over in Greece. And so he left his son with these Burger Kings and said, make sure they're in good shape when I get back. He turned those two uh, Burger Kings now into 1.9 billion with 800 Applebee's, Taco Bells, and Panera's bread. And so I've always looked at him as what well, building this franchise concept is, I want to keep buying these things. And so I'm just building equity and building equity in the hopes that someday I cash, I cash in. So uh, that is a wrap. I've listed some of the key takeaways. <laughs> Am I like the, person that, the only person that got beeped? <laughs> key takeaways, I also have some key tools as well um, for you guys to use afterwards. Awesome. Round of applause.